pro athletes train so much because we always tend to picture them when they're training and we just think they're training all the time and actually more is not necessarily best. It's about actually knowing when to rest and recover. That's a real skill. So Ava, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you today to talk about one of my favorite topics, uh, collagen and longevity and anti-aging. I just think this is so relevant for so many people. And I've personally been trying the collagen supplement and absolutely loving it, the taste of it and the results. So we're gonna dive all into that on today's episode. But first of all, a very warm welcome to the show. Well, thank you, thank you, Angela, for inviting me to speak. A pleasure to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, so we were chatting just before, and I think uh, you have so much knowledge in relation to how collagen works in the body, um, the structure, why we need it. I think that let's sort of that's probably a really good place to start. Um, what's going on when we're training hard as we're aging, and why might we need to start supplementing with collagen, and when is the right time for that? Well, I mean, collagen essentially is a structural protein in the, in the body. And for a long time, we were saying we've been obsessed with the single cell and, and, you know, rightly so the basic unit of life is the cell beat, muscle, skin, tendon. But around that cell is this sort of quite complex scaffolding, if you like. It's an amazing tissue that actually um, transports chemicals and actually allows the cell to both communicate and make the tissue what it is specific to its function but also it, it feeds back into the cell as to what's happening to it as we move as we degrade now every time we move every time we exercise we're degrading our extracellular matrix that means we're breaking it down that's how we adapt to exercise that's how we become better fitter stronger so what happens is that the collagen is this major sort of the most common protein in this extracellular matrix this extracellular matrix is affected by excess, breaks down, feeds back into the cell, cell then delivers a complex chemical communication as well back to the collagen and actually even sometimes changes direction, builds it back bigger, stronger in the direction that we need a better quality collagen fibril. So that means that the structure of the actual tissue, be it skin, tendon, muscle, is then of better quality. Okay, amazing. And when when we're like working out, obviously that sort of wear and tear on the joints, some of that is going to be coming from the type of exercise that we're doing, right? So when we look at something like tennis, for example, it involves a lot of different lateral movements and actually you're stopping quite hard before you then take off again, right? That's very wearing on the joints, running, for example, less more so than say something like cycling or swimming where you're really well supported. Um, do you find that depending on the type of sport that people are doing, they're going to see greater wear and tear and, and greater need for support in this regard? I mean, absolutely. The loading of both joints and, and soft tissues is very sport specific. And you're right, like the, there are lots of multidirectional changes in tennis. But remember that also like with things like cartilage and joints, um, part of this loading is necessary for cartilage health. The real sweet spot is to know how much we can load to make muscles strong and sort of for these sort of compressive forces to be dampened a little bit, but compress enough so that this tissue is strong, healthier, better, because that's actually the only way that cartilage gets its vascular supply, but it's compression. It's designed to actually compress. What is important is that what we do as professionals that work with, with pro sportsmen is actually measure where this sweet spot is for the athlete because actually it's it's quite genetic as well and it does have to do with previous injury history and so how we load is is the real art in in elite sports if that makes sense mm. um but it isn't just a, a negative sort of these are old um ways to describe what happens when you exercise you know it's like oh you know self-imposed damage or actually loading is a positive thing for the body it makes you structurally stronger um, and it's just knowing how to load and knowing when to rest and recover. That is the real art in order to prevent injury. That's interesting. So what you're saying, because obviously I knew the benefits that when you are using something like resistance training, for example, not only are you strengthening the muscle tissue, you're also strengthening bone density. It has positive effects on that. But it sounds like what you're saying is the cartilage actually is being yes. strengthened by those exercises as well. So there's exactly. Kind of it's kind of like a, this compressive force actually allows all the fluids and chemicals to sort of bathe the cartilage and sustain it and actually cartilage health so important if you think about it you know osteoarthritis is more common in obese sedentary population than it is 
um, in the in the average population. So this is all about, and again, that has to do also with, with the muscle strength around the joint to protect what happens. Um, you know, so when you get these um, multi-directional changes in, in tennis, for example, um, the muscles are highly adapted to be able to sustain that. The important thing is to know when to rest and recover so that we don't sustain uh, you know, sudden onset type loading that then damages the cartilage irreversibly. Yeah, very interesting. And I know you were mentioning actually when we were chatting just before that what you see in the difference between your pro athletic clients and patients compared to the, the amateur ones, often people who are not competing are actually overtraining. And you were talking there a little bit about the sweet spot. What would you say? And I, I know that, you know, obviously genetics play a part. Um, also their recovery, their sleep, everything else they've got on. Uh, and, and with somebody who, for example, is an amateur athlete, they're probably working full time as well. And they've got a fairly high stress mm -hmm. load in their life. It's not, yeah, their sole job. But I'm just curious because I think, you know, some, some of the research I've seen actually is that when you start to exercise over an hour in terms of endurance work, so people that are doing Ironmans, you know, ultra marathons, things like that, actually there can be significant cardiovascular implications from over exercising. And it seems, and particularly in the female population, I think, um, in those that are still cycling, um, in terms of supporting hormone levels, it seems to me that if you're not a pro athlete, we can talk about the differences there, that actually somewhere around 45 minutes to 60 minutes is about optimal in terms of exercise. But I'm just curious on your, your valued opinion on this. Yes, and it, it um, I mean, it is, like what happens in amateur athletes when you're giving general advice, and that's the difficulty we have as sports medicine doctors, that it's actually very difficult to give general advice because you and me will be very different physical specimens, our histories will be very different, the way we've evolved will be very different. So what we do is consider the individual and what they've done and their physical condition, you know, their weight, their aptitude, their injury history, what they did when they were growing up, what sort of sports did they do? You know, did you do 10 hours of gymnastics a day when you were 14? Is your spine paying the price for that? Like, so all of that, the injuries you carry as a result of your previous history, have you, are you overweight? Have you been overweight? You know, what is your current condition? These, all of these factors, obviously illnesses, medications, you know, um, you know, all of this is relevant for us to make a judgment. And, what we see is in the in the non-professional, as you rightly say, you know, uh, professional athletes, ha this is their job, that's what they have to worry about, you know, they, they consider the loading very carefully, they get professional advice, they can dedicate time and, and energy to this. In my non-pro, these are real considerations, work, the number of hours actually they spend sitting at a desk, they, you know, some of, um, I have um, a patient who's a non-pro athlete, but actually competed in Olympic qualifiers, but was spending 10 hours a day doing, doing work in his office and then trained, which is incredible for him as an individual, not so good for his spine or his, um, or his you know, what, what was happening when he was actually loading his spine when he wasn't sitting. So all of these things are, when, when we see a patient in clinic, we individualize the advice we give. Often I'm asking, and it's really difficult to get, you know, so show me your training diary, what have you done this week? To talk me through your week. What does it look like, you know? And then, and then actually you give specific advice to that person to modify. Sadly, when they come to me, usually they've been injured. So we're learning a little bit from our mistakes. And you're right, I think, you know, there's this concept of like train more, pro athletes train so much because we always tend to picture them when they're training and we just think of the training all the time. And actually more is not necessarily best. It's about actually knowing when to rest and recover. That's a real skill. And it is possible, I think, as an amateur athlete to get to know yourself really well. But often the same stresses around work, family, earning a living aside from your sport, sometimes dampen the signals that our body is sending around recovery. Um, so it's like, I need to run because I'm super stressed and I need to get rid of this horrible tension. And yes, there's a benefit to relieving stress with exercise, but musculoskeletally, there's also, a, you know, a, a load that you're sustaining and that you have to measure because, you know, uh, musculoskeletal tissues need recovery too. So, mm -hmm. so the, this is the, the real difficulty. And I think it, um, when you do go on this journey, then I'm a triathlete. It's amazing because on the other end, they're training better. They're enjoying their training more. They've got a much more healthy relationship with exercise. But it's a real change in lifestyle and thinking that needs to happen. And that's often a really difficult 
thing to do and to undertake. Mm. I think so, because as, as we were saying before, right, it becomes quite addictive because of the endorphin release that you're getting. And I think what I've seen with people as well is, is when they perpetually do that, sometimes actually what happens is they don't actually create enough polarity in the training. So they're not doing enough recovery and they're also not exercising hard enough because you can go out for a long run, but not push that hard and still get this tremendous endorphin release. But it's causing kind of significant inflammation in the body, upregulating cortisol. And I don't know about you, but what I end up seeing is this is when people come, they have injuries, but they also end up with body fat that they can't lose, particularly around the abdominal area. And that always signifies to me that cortisol is kind of being raised uh quite significantly um so it is interesting i guess when you're talking about the cartilage there and then i want to talk about the supplement and how it supports just so people can understand if they are exercising a lot you're saying that stressing the, the joints actually helps with that tissue um but what about in terms of the balance of say mobility work and stretching that needs to go alongside any exercise program what have you found is, is optimal there um, yes and again it depends on your sport um, and, and what you do, um, but I'm, I'm absolutely a big fan of um, keeping your spine on mobility. So actually structurally working to not only stretch, I mean, I think the static stretching is a little bit, I, I like static stretching sometimes for muscle length, if people are particularly short, but dynamic stretching is really what, what sort of um, is coming into, and there are so many lovely um, sports and exercise modalities that now, sort of take in, incorporate a little bit of the static dynamic stretching interface that actually keeps, as you say, the spinal mobility, the mobility around those tissues that, that otherwise become very tight. Depends on your sport. You know, some sports need to be stiffer in order to perform at, at you know, sort of at their, at their optimal level. But, but there is, there needs to be an understanding about, um, as you say, moving certain structures because otherwise you end up with muscle shortening and that can be pathological in itself, I think. Mm. And with the collagen, um, just moving to that now, because I think it's, uh, I know a lot of listeners will be really interested in this. Um, when you're taking collagen, one question I have, because obviously it's a, an incomplete essential amino acid profile, right? It's missing the tryptophan. For that to work in the body, does it need to be taken independently of other sources of protein so that the body is seeing that as a sort of isolated structure or can you take it as part of something else like can you have a protein shake and then add your collagen in for example will you still get the same benefits we um we absorb it well because what we do is we're not absorbing the collagen molecule itself we're actually um, absorbing the peptide the collagen peptide so it's a breakdown version that's why it's sort of, you're going to have it naturally kind of in a bone broth but what we have found is that in the studies is that in a supplement, we can super concentrate the amount of peptides that you absorb and that's well absorbed into the gut. And therefore we also see that there's more collagen peptide in the tissues that need it. So those studies are, are really coming together. So actually it's very, I always say, take it as naturally as you can take it with food. It's well absorbed. Your body is literally using it as a little, oh, this is a little building block that I need. I want to take it, absorb it, use it. So there's no real, I would say, you know, obviously um, I'm always very uh, aware that things like tea and coffee um, inhibit absorption of pretty much everything. And with our supplements, um, you know, there's a couple of components there that would be affected by tea and coffee. So I would say keep well away from tea and coffee when you're trying to get, absorb something, um, and uh, which I find really difficult, obviously, because I and my coffee in the morning is like part of my religion. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, but, uh, but you, you do need a little bit, you need to be, just be clever about, a little bit like a vitamin pill. If you're going to take a multivitamin pill, don't take it with coffee or tea. Uh, but that, those would be, but not necessarily because of the collagen peptide, but rather the other the other things in the supplement. Oh, right, in terms of inhibiting the absorption. Okay, so interestingly, so the body is going to kind of see that peptide chain and use it as it needs to. Yes. Okay, so taking it along with other food and protein. It absorbs it into the gut and then uses it as, as required. Okay, interesting. And does it also then prompt the body? I've seen some literature, I think, around the fact that not only are you benefiting from that collagen, it's also because the body sees it and sees this collagen, it almost up then up regulates your own collagen pathway production, because it's almost perceived almost, I suppose, almost like an injury, right? Oh, there's a need for collagen. Absolutely. The, um, the, I mean, essentially, we decrease our collagen production from the age of 25. We just basically, we don't produce as much. Our metabolism has slowed. Interestingly, this is kind of the age when we start calling athletes mature. 
I mean, very, very um, cruelly. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, yeah. Sort of, we, we treat 28 year old athletes very differently to 20 year olds. You know, there's just, just different metabolisms, different ways of rehabilitating. They take longer coming back from an injury repair mechanism. So it's an interesting correlation there. Obviously, these are complex processes as well. We can't just say it's collagen, but but we do know that um, we can basically um, increase the, the collagen production by actually taking collagen peptides. So we see it in our gut. And then interestingly, in cartilage particularly, which I'm really fascinated by, when you surround little cartilage cells with collagen peptides, not only do they, do they take it on board, but actually they produce the type two collagen that is specific for cartilage. And the more collagen peptide you surround these cells with, the more collagen type two they produce, which is the type of collagen that you need for cartilage. So it's not only clever in absorbing it, but it's clever in producing the type of collagen that you need to produce. Interesting. Because different, you know, there are different collagen types and they're specific yeah. to different bodily tissues. Yeah, because I've seen like some some supplement companies now producing like different types of, of, of collagen, um, uh, type like type one, type two, and then like using ones from sort of eggshells and things like that. Um, is this formulation primarily to support joint health or is that the same collagen that will support skin health, for example? Yes, so we have the types of collagen we have in this supplement support skin health, joint health, tendon, muscle. There is an ongoing, we, we are looking into an ongoing study where there's going to be specific type two, which is specific to cartilage, um, type two collagen. But the one, this supplement actually supports all tissues at the moment. And we do know that the cartilage cells produce type two. Our question is like, can we maximize type two production if we give it type two collagen? That's, okay. But that's specific to cartilage and joint health. At the moment, we're seeing good benefits with what we're giving. We're just doing another study to say, well, actually, can we super maximize the joint health aspect of collagen type two? Yeah, interesting. And so for somebody who is, for example, an exerciser, uh, like, you know, exercises regularly, uh, maybe puts a bit more strain on their joints and things. If they're looking for, and obviously we can't, the body's intelligent, right? It's going to use it wherever it believes is most necessary. Would you say that you might need to increase the amount that you're taking, for example, like, are there benefits? You know, I've seen people, for example, who have the have a collagen powder, the powder version, and then they just scoop it into, um, into into say tea well tea and coffee but that's when it's just collagen yeah. um, and have it multiple times a day like is it something we should take like regularly like that I'm just curious what the optimal way to get the maximum benefits is so the um so for there are the studies are starting to look at what's the optimal time realistically we're saying that if you are taking for tendon repair or muscle strength the studies have taken it but this is partly because it's easy to do a study this way giving a collagen supplement about an hour before you exercise means that actually there are some improvements in strength, certainly some improvements in tendon repair in the little small studies. Now we're starting to just scratch the surface of how much we understand, but certainly in taking it an hour before exercise is great. We know that definitely there are some benefits, although we definitely need to make these studies bigger and better to absolutely say this is a causal evidence-based, you know, like a um, uh, result. And then, but what is also interesting is that we know by theory that for cartilage, for example, I think skin's the same, so cartilage cells have a little cartilage clock that they know what time of day it is and they know to switch on that cartilage clock and actually switch on repair mechanisms. Interestingly, we know that that in um, people with, that don't sleep well, insomniacs and um, people who have night shifts, for example, have higher rates of osteoarthritis. Um, now, so so we do think that cartilage health is affected by lack of sleep. And um, so the 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 association is there. Actually, the cartilage clock switches its repair mechanism on during our sleep, and also it would make sense because the cartilage is kind of loaded so it can just carry on with its function without without worrying about the load. Um, so, so we recommend that for cartilage health, particularly an hour with a sort of around the, the evening meal, an hour before bed or sort of around the evening meal would probably be beneficial, but we haven't proved that in the clinical studies yet. The most important thing is that you have it at least once a day. A little bit like there's no... Um, there isn't any problem with absorption, like for example, there is with turmeric, you know, where you have to sort of continually take it throughout the day to absorb it. Collagen peptides absorb really well. And once it's in your body, it isn't like, as long as you have it in your body, the building blocks is in there and your body will use as required. 
the optimal dose response we haven't yet identified. We do know that there's a dose response with cartilage cells. So if you surround them more, we, we produce more collagen type two. So we do think that the higher doses are beneficial. That's why sort of in the TRR supplement, we sort of, we, we, um, we sort of really increase the dose uh, as the sort of the highest collagen dose in the market because it was delivering, you know, it, it was delivering the sort of doses we wanted for athletes, essentially. So, so there, there will be more around dose response. We don't know what the top, with most um, dose response relationships, you get to better results, better results, better results as you increase the dose. And then you do reach a plateau where additional doses don't produce additional benefits. We don't have and reach that plateau with, with collagen yet. So, the great thing is though that the, there's no adverse effects really you know it's a protein so you're not taking anything that's that's strange or random for your body it's something that it already you know is a building block so so um your body interprets it as such you know there isn't anything that you think oh my goodness it's going to be a toxicity just won't use what it doesn't need but we haven't got to a point yet where we've been able to supplement collagen to a dose where we're saying oh actually it's more than we need that's interesting, isn't it? It's a little bit like I remember speaking to I interviewed Wade Lightheart, who's the, the founder of Bioptimizers, and he has uh, one of their, their things, uh, they produce a lot of products, but one is the digestive enzymes. And I think he did an experiment where he took up to like a thousand digestive enzymes and couldn't find any limit to the number of proteolytic enzymes you could take to facilitate you know, like tissue repair, but also um, digestion and stuff. And it's, it's funny, isn't it? I guess more studies needed really to see if there is a cap. Um, mm -hmm. And at which point, yeah, it becomes a waste of, of, of the product really in the body. Um, so with with that, what if you were, I know you've mentioned taking it with food and just for the bioavailability issue, if you're someone like, I, I quite like to eat well in advance of bed, like would there be a benefit then to say, taking it before bed on a on an empty stomach, will it be well absorbed and then facilitate that repair while you're sleeping? Because obviously the body's doing a lot of repair work at night. Let's say, I mean, we haven't had any adverse effects in taking before bed. I would say that um, it's quite concentrated, the supplement, because it's like a, a protein concentrate if you like. So it's a little bit like eating a steak before bed. Would you want to do that? I don't, you know, I, I, um, I, I know um, some of the pro athletes that take it, take it first thing in the morning because it's easy as a shot and they, and they, um, they're off and they've done it and they're happy doing that and they haven't um, had any adverse effects. I think it's quite concentrated on an empty stomach, but if you're eating, depending on when you're eating, I mean, your stomach takes about five hours and depending on what you eat as well, five hours to empty. So actually you'd be safe in a five hour window from the last meal anyway. And when I say safe, I, I mean, safe from sort of feeling a little bit bloaty or, or like you've had a steak on an empty stomach, you know, which is yeah. what it what it um, what it feels like. I think no, no real adverse effects. Um, if you've got a very sort of, I guess, sensitive stomach, you probably feel very uncomfortable. I'm not sure. Um, but no, nothing really in terms of to report in terms of concerns, which is obviously sort of a big relief and, and very exciting for us. Um, and uh, yes, like I, I, it's just really sort of what feels comfortable for you, how it works, really, how it best fits into your life is important as well. What I do like about it is that because it's a protein, you know, the sort of mid afternoon cravings. So if you exercise sort of early evening and that, you know, which a lot of um, non professionals do, um, it, I've noticed it does away with the cravings. A lot of the athletes support, oh, it's fantastic because I have it with my mid afternoon snack one and a half hours before exercise. And I find I'm not craving that three o'clock slump anymore, which is quite nice if you're trying to sort of regulate your weight or, yeah. or um, you know, or you're sort of trying to do away with sort of nasty cravings. <laughs> it's nice. I don't know whether there's anything in it that energizes. My, my husband has a has a knack of finding supplements that I'm taking. <laughs> that I try and hide. <laughs> I put these in the fridge because I think they taste really, really nice cold, the cherry. And he's like, these taste really good and I feel really good on them. Uh, so I don't know. Is there anything? There's some vitamin C in there, isn't there? Let's talk about right. the other bits because you've put in like hyaluronic acid and turmeric is in there, I believe, as well right. to help lower inflammation. If you see turmeric, copper, um, all of these support joint health. The turmeric is a natural anti-inflammatory, natural antioxidant. We like it very much. For I'm a big fan of turmeric for joint health and uh, dampening inflammation. So actually, we wanted something because athletes are sort of training every day most of the time we want a little bit of turmeric just to keep everything nice and and calm the other thing is um vitamin c and copper are essential for joint health but also it's one of those things that is beneficial for an athlete to have because if you do train regularly 
we are always worried that you're sort of immunosuppressing because that's one of the things that we didn't mention earlier that if you're over training you actually get immune suppression which is actually not not something that we want or see beneficial it increases your risks of uh, respiratory tract infections and and other infections and obviously we always um you know consider that you know immune function and cancer um, have close relationships as well so so these are beneficial things for overall health and well-being um, but also particularly support joint function, which we were obviously one was one of our key uh, aims. Yeah, yeah, sure. And the and the the vitamin C helps you absorb or, and also make more collagen, right? That's exactly right, and it's um, naturally good for immunity and you know natural wow. antioxidants for skin. And well, as you know, you'll tell me all about that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I really like taking the supplement. It's really, really nice. So is the reason for saying, because I've seen I've seen quite a few people mix, as I say, collagen into their coffee and stuff. I've done it myself because it dissolves so well with other collagen. But these are collagen powders that are just collagen. They don't have the other things. That's Would right. the reason for not mixing this one not be because of the collagen absorption, but because of the other compounds? You then wouldn't be absorbing those as effectively. That's right. I, I think it's the turmeric, the vitamin C, the copper, you know, they can all particularly be affected. Um, I think it's also the coffee produces more gastric acid. So, so I never like if something's very concentrated, unless you have some fat in your stomach to like descend the daily, it's just nice to um, keep them separate if you can. But yeah, absorption, collagen peptide itself, not a problem at all. Uh, but it's the other factors that I would like to, you know, the vitamin C and things that, that are definitely severely affected by coffee. And that's also in the powdered version. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they're identical. It's really for ease. You can take yeah. whichever one you prefer. Exactly. Yeah. Or combine as, as a lot of people do as well. They get yeah. one and they sort of move on to the other, or if they're traveling, it's easier to take one and not the other, or um, taking them to the gym or, uh, you know, not having to prepare a shake um, for some people. So it's just really designed to fit into your life, be it professional and athletic life or going to the gym or traveling or, um, you know, taking into your training bag. It's, it's just really to give you options so that you're not, oh, you know, it's really difficult to take all my powder to my gym and I'm traveling and, you know, and I'm not, I'm going to miss a few days. And that's where, you know, it's, it's because it's a nutritional supplement, you need to take it every day to support your body absorbing and using. Okay, that's interesting, because that was going to be my next question, actually, was, is there any reason to or benefit to cycle on and off it at all and give your body a break, you know, like, do it five days out of seven, for example, or is it something you should consistently take every day? Well, the studies around, again, and we're, you know, we're starting, these are um, early, this is early evidence with collagen. So as far as medicine is concerned, remember, we take a long time usually to establish evidence if we don't, because of funding limits. So it takes a couple of decades usually to really establish um, good evidence in medicine. So, but um, what we know is that in the longer term studies, the ones that do sort of repeated weeks have been done for joint health. So it's, they've reported on joint pain, particularly, and MRI changes, which are really exciting, and cartilage, and they have consistently taken it every day. The strength ones are shorter, but again, they have been taking it every day. So what we do know is that it works when you take every day. We haven't explored not taking it every day because obviously we want, we're still at the causal end, we're still trying to establish how well it works and what it works for. So for that, we need to be sure that it's bioavailable. Yeah. I think when we're there, then you can start exploring you know, the little breaks that you might be able to give your body, but we're not there yet. And we're not sure um, whether, uh, you know, the breaks will affect, you know, overall health of the structure that you're trying to heal or support. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And in terms of the, I know the research is ongoing and, it, and it's early days in terms of how much you need, but would you say from what you've seen, the dosage comes down to a function of the size of the individual, the amount of strain that they're placing on themselves, overall stress and joint, et cetera, or a combination of the two? I think combination of the two. Um, uh, and like I say, we're, we're still exploring this dose response. And, um, but, uh, but I do think it's, yeah, I, I, I would target the particular demands you're putting on your body, um, you know, at a particular time, be it, and those are mental demands as well. Um, uh, so, you know, stress cortisol is affected by mind and central nervous system. So again, you know, these are, these are reasons to sort of, um, take supplements and take them intelligently. Yeah, for sure. 
And um, what would you say then that when you're looking at the non-professional market, uh, what would you say your clientele there that are the kind of biggest mistakes they might be making that you'd like them to take account of in terms of their recovery? Maybe they're not sleeping enough, overtraining. What, what have you found? Well, this concept, one of the big things, I, I'm always really surprised, and perhaps it's because we sort of come from a British culture where we are very blessed to have free healthcare. But a lot of my clients will be spending a fortune perhaps on, on creams for their faces or beauty products, travel, good restaurants, but it's difficult to invest in healthcare. And that's your health and your body and your well-being. If you look at the high earners and the people that are unfortunately not so well, be it disabled by musculoskeletal problems, spinal problems or other medical problems, it's it always surprises me that we don't consider that investment in healthcare is is important. So that's I think one of the big ones that always um surprises me. You know, they'll go for the the, the thing that is either paid for by the insurance or um that they don't have to pay for. And it's for me that's sometimes really sad like in terms of like it's insane you know like when when you can sort of afford um good products good health care by the price of like two meals you know yeah, <laughs> or so, you know like it's just like my goodness in terms of the long-term benefits of one and the other um it always saddens me a little bit and I think it's it's culture change I think it's different in different countries and um, that's one of the ones the other ones is yes, adequate rest and recovery. Learn to listen to your body, and and of sometimes we've lost this link because we're so caught up in our jobs and our families and in what needs to be done. That is also important. But this whole, if you, if you don't have that link, if your body's giving you signs of something hurts, get it sorted, get it diagnosed, get proper treatment. Don't ignore it. It's gone on for more than two days. Get a diagnosis. Suddenly, more than a week. Um, because running on an injury often creates irreversible damage that then you're always having to, um, and I say running, competing, uh, you know, continue with the activity or that or sport that you love and ignoring symptoms never plays out well musculoskeletally. And often it's a simple fix, a simple, um, simple advice, simple treatment, good diagnosis to begin with, and then off you go and you can enjoy your life. Um, if you don't have that good relationship in terms of understanding the signs that your body's giving you, speak to somebody who can teach you about load progression, low periodization, adequate recovery, rest, nutrition, supplements. Um, because often, again, it's a very short term investment and the overall scale of things. Um, it, it's actually very small and the health benefits and the long term quality of life benefit, the ability to enjoy your family as you get older is so important and often just we don't just don't understand that sometimes we just need to invest that time energy and expense into looking after ourselves if we enjoy sport and if we enjoy um loading a, a skeleton frequently and intensely um which has you know immense benefits but you know when they break down get it sorted the quick i always say to my patients is the quicker you know, they always say, oh, yeah, but athletes, footballers, oh, my goodness, they, they recover so quickly. You know, they they immediately they get them. It's like, yeah, but, but we, we often have a diagnosis on the pitch. And if we don't have a diagnosis on the pitch, we'll have it that evening. And if we don't have it that evening, we'll definitely have it by the next day. Um, or we're fine tuning it by the by the next day. That means that we start treatment pretty much straight away because we have a diagnosis very quickly. So th those are the biggest things, I think, that, you know, do not continue your activity with pain, you shouldn't, exercise should not cause pain, it should cause, you know, suddenly um, effort that sometimes feels painful, but it shouldn't cause long-standing pain. Do not ignore swelling, get diagnosis, get treated. Um, don't be afraid to invest in the short term because of the long-term benefits, it's suddenly something to be considered. And often it's very difficult, I think, when you exercise, when you're athletic to um, think long-term. And it's one of the things that we always have to do in professional sport you know like a um career quality of life are are important so um sudden risks are assumable it doesn't mean that you're going to go and see a sports physician and they're going to say you cannot run you cannot participate you cannot do your exercise class some risks you know are, are assumable but you need to have educated um discussions around what risks are just not worth it and and what risks are and it's often a real a real sort of uh, multidisciplinary discussion as to yes we can do that or no or we have to just 
um, shorten the duration and the intensity for a little while in order to get, or we need to retrain your postural control or your core um, in order to protect your spine going forward because we've sustained X injury or Y. So it's just that conversation that often um, we think that if we go to the doctor, we're going to be shut down and we're not going to be allowed to run. That's really, you know, of another time. Um, you know, what we do all the time is actually modify what you do. Rarely do I tell a person to stop their exercise. They have to be very injured for me to do that. It's just uh, yeah, a case of modifying it. And I guess um, my other question would be around what have you found aside from uh, the TR collagen supplement um, to be beneficial for people who are training hard and maybe they are also working hard? Are there other um, foods nutritionally that you think they should definitely be prioritizing in terms of getting those micronutrients in and maybe even like, you know, more protein than the average individual, but also certain supplements that you think are very supportive of, of achieving that longevity, both in sport and life? Well, I think it, that has to be very unique to the individual and what their demands are. So it's, a, it's like, you know, I'm not sort of trying to avoid the question, it's just more, you know, what we do in, in sports medicine is very much tailor make, um, you know, a program for the person, depending on their demands, their sport, what their requirements are. Um, so, I mean, I think speaking generally, vitamin D is the big one. Um, we have a lot of vitamin D deficiency, mainly because, um, you know, we're a little bit like plants. We have to be fully exposed to the sun to produce vitamins with vitamin D. And there's all the um, data around cancer and obviously aging is one of those. But all you need is 20 minutes twice a day. But we do need enough sun to do that. So in the UK, we don't get that very often. And if we do, rarely are we fully exposed. So, you know, none of us walk around in a bikini or, or shorts um, <laughs> for very long, at least. So... So actually vitamin D is one of the things that I like monitoring and I like on sort of the fairly high end of, of levels. Um, and we see a lot of deficiency and often um, my patients feel much better when that's addressed. They feel more energetic. They find themselves in a, in a better state of mind, even mentally, when we've addressed vitamin D deficiency. And that's anecdotal because that hasn't been studied, but it's a thing. Um, and then uh, I would say also, you know, watchful around the vitamin C and zinc as supplements as well. I really like those. I think a lot of us get immunosuppressed over tiredness, fatigue, travel, recent injury, illness. I like supplementing those quite often for a little while. They, they don't need to be done all the time, but suddenly around infection time, for example, I'm a big fan of high dose vitamin C and zinc. Um, but I keep it quite basic. And then um, suddenly there's, there's evidence for protein and strength, especially in the, in the aging population. And obviously women around the menopause have very particular requirements as well. There's so much going on with um, diet and influences at the moment. And there's so much bad press around dairy. And so I always worry about my premenopausal women and even the young women, because there is evidence that if you don't have enough calcium intake in your, for example, early twenties, that you're going to sort of have a higher risk of osteoporosis um post menopause so so again those are things that are that i'm very watchful around in particular sectors of the population um but i would say you know get get personal advice on what your requirements are because we can we've we've become quite good at actually tailor making programs yeah very definitely i think i think what i found with protein a lot of people really do genuinely find it difficult at the beginning to eat enough because I think everyone mm. just neglects it don't they they neglect it in the morning they neglect it really at lunch and then they might have something big in the evening which probably often gives them more protein than they can actually absorb in that one sitting and they benefit so much and I don't know about you but I just see the cognitive benefits are enormous once you start putting protein in in the morning they're like suddenly feel so much switched on because you've got this ready supply of essential amino acids um no, I agree. And, um, and this is, um, and, you know, in terms of like we were speaking about craving, I think people eat better. Um, they're more satisfied. They, they have that sort of um, well-being feeling of having had a good meal when they eat protein regularly. I'm a big fan of regular protein intake. I think so. And just lastly, on the TRR, so I noticed the cherry in it. Is that just... Um, is that the vitamin C and the flavor? Or I know cherry itself actually is also very beneficial. It's an antioxidant. Yes, we had um, um so so that was just the flavor. We, did, we weren't so concerned with um the need for um you know uh, in order to have an antioxidant benefit. Yes, it does, but I would say like if, if that's what I was after, I would just super maximize the the cherry, the black cherry um 
uh, intake, but that's more around flavor and to flavor it naturally, we wanted something that, you know, was, was good for you as well. So, so hence, hence the cherry flavor. Yeah, that was the thing that one of the things I really liked about it as well is just so many things in sport are full of artificial sweeteners. And this just didn't, this just the cherry and a little bit of stevia. Absolutely. Like we just don't, yeah, we, we don't like the, the, um, increasingly I think there's a drive towards more natural products and, uh, and, um, so we were very keen to sort of get rid of anything that was artificial or artificial sweeteners and they're not associated with particular, uh, good results in athletes either, because, you know, they move obviously their gut. And, uh, so for, for example, runners, it would be, uh, you know, the cumulative effect of artificial sweeteners is not a good one. So we stayed well away from them. Sure. No, I love it. Well, where can people find out more? I think uh, we have a discount sh- uh, code that we'll share in the show notes, but where can people find out more about you, Ava, your practice, and also more about TRR and the, uh, the supplement? Well, we sort of, we've got a, I mean, I, I work at the, we're called the Sports Medical Group. I work at 25 Harley Street and also at Castle Street in Guildford. Um, and there's a website, uh, sportsmedicalgroup.com, and then there's the TRR dot com website as well where they can find all the details about the products and the athletes that are taking it and are associated with it but we're always also if you had any further questions on the follow-up to this because there's so much information it's really difficult to contain any further questions we we've got a section on the trr website for further questions that we address personally so can individualize um, any questions or any particular concerns you might have Amazing. Thank you so much for that. We will link to all of that in the show notes. And thanks for sharing all your wisdom and expertise and coming on the show. It's been a pleasure having you. A pleasure chatting to you. Thank you. Hope you have a good result. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>